Let me start by saying I was wrong about remote work, kind of. When the world started ditching offices about three years ago, I held a pretty strong belief that an all remote team would be absolutely dominated by an in-person team. Now that the dust has settled and we have like three years worth of data about remote work and hybrid work and it's kind of here to stay, I figured it was time to take all of my assumptions and put them to the test. So here's what I learned. Let's start with the numbers. In 2019, it's estimated that there were roughly 6% of fully remote positions available. Now in 2023, roughly estimated, there are 12% of positions. So that's doubled, fully remote, never going in the office at all. Hybrid is also a larger number than it was before. Hybrid being sometimes in the office, sometimes remote. Hybrid was roughly seven to 9% before the pandemic. And now it's all the way up to 28% of people are in hybrid solutions. But that leaves 60% of the workforce is still going to the office every single day. With that out of the way, the next thing I wanted to take a look at was are people getting more done? Now, I held the belief that people were generally more productive, but that a lot of people felt a little more off the hook and just kind of went their own way watching Netflix, doing whatever they wanted during the day besides working. The quiet quitting movement helped feed that idea of mine. Well, if you ask anybody who works remote or look at any single study that's been done about remote or hybrid work in the last few years, you'll find that everybody who has that position is generally way happier with the arrangement. It's so much more flexible from a time standpoint, from a workload standpoint, you don't have people breathing down your neck, you lose the, the need for a commute. You just wake up and go to work in whatever environment you have at home. So people are happier, but are people getting more done? And that's where it's actually extremely hard to figure out if people are getting more done because the only way to judge the productivity is to look at the results. But if you're a high performing results driven culture, but people are burning out, well, is that really more productive? Even if you're getting more done as a company, if people are burning out because of work-life balance or whatever else, I'm not sure that that's also that productive, which means productivity is actually a combination of culture and results, not one or the other. Are your people happier and are you getting the work done? Anecdotally, I believe that there's a huge reason for some remote cultures that work very successfully and others that don't at all. And it's 100% driven by the culture of how you do work. Let me explain. In a synchronous, real-time, in-person workforce, you're regularly meeting together to get things done. You have meetings in person, you drop by the cubicle, you have conversations, you work through things in real time with each other. Remote work, though, allows for asynchronous work, things that happen at different times. You leave a message, someone responds when they have time, or you send an email and you don't kind of expect anything, or maybe your workforce has dramatically different working hours, even if you're in the same time zone, because that's the flexibility part of remote work. Well, if you try to take a synchronous work environment and strap it onto an asynchronous environment, there's gonna be a lot of friction. If you're always expecting to get things done by meeting with other people, well, you're likely going to suffer from Zoom fatigue because you're always hopping on meetings with the people who are now remote and they're stuck staring at your face for several hours a day while you try to figure out a problem because your culture is positioned for synchronous work. It's foolish to believe a synchronous culture is going to thrive in an asynchronous environment. That's why when you look at companies like Zapier or GitLab who were fully remote before the pandemic, they are very intentional about their remote work culture. They have an entire guidebook set up just for how to do the basic operational needs of a company. Their leadership is trained and developed in a way that manages a remote workforce. They aren't just taking what they did before and just doing it over Zoom. They're actually literally redesigning the foundation of their company, or in their case, they designed the foundation of their company to support a remote work environment. Some values and principles that those companies share are things like detailed, clear outcomes. They do intentional work on developing their workforce because there's a lot of accountability required to deliver results. They're also extremely intentional about topics like burnout, 
meetings, and work-life balance, they treat them as first-class citizens when they design their strategy. I believe the success and productivity of any remote workforce 100% depends on the culture and the values and the principles that guide it. The next thing I was curious about is you hear about all these big companies that are starting to put in these somewhat aggressive return to office policies. Even Zoom has a new policy that says anybody within a 50 mile radius is gonna be required to start returning to the office. If remote work is so great, then why are these RTO policies starting to make the headlines almost everywhere you look? A common belief that people often shout is that you can't build culture remotely and you can't build culture remotely the same way, but it's not like a 100% great reason to just tell everybody to start returning to work, especially if your company's been fairly productive without being in the office. So what if RTO has nothing to do with productivity at all? Think about this. Some companies are tied to long-term lease agreements for their office space. Their return to office policy may be more driven by the fact that we're paying for this thing and we're not using it than actually considering the impact of remote productivity. Unoccupied space still needs maintenance and it's a little bit harder to sell if it's not a lease agreement and you actually own the property if there's nobody in it. This misalignment between the real estate decisions and the remote culture decisions can lead to some weird outcomes like a return to office policy that's not based on anything that's like legit data. Another reason there may be aggressive RTO policies is to weed out the people who only wanna work remote. If you're running a company and you believe that it's important to have everyone in a room, which you're allowed to do, then this is a cheaper way to get those people to willingly leave the digital nomads who refuse to be in person than to actually fire them. It's actually a brilliant power move on behalf of the company as long as they don't disenfranchise the workers that they actually need to keep the lights on. And I think maybe a more common part of RTO is that it's easier to reward your workplace with benefits that they see in person. Like not everything is financial. Some people are driven by recognition. Some people are driven by perks like a parking spot or a cool office. Perks aren't bad, but are they the main reason that there should be an RTO policy? Well, they can be part of building culture and part of rewarding your high performers in ways that aren't financial because after a certain point, apparently the money you make doesn't actually make you happier. I'm a proponent of returning to the office because I personally like being together with my team, but it's good to be paranoid and a little suspicious about RTO policies that don't exactly match up with the things that you're trying to do as a company. Perhaps the biggest lesson that I learned looking through all these assumptions I had about remote work is that you can't have proximity with remote work. Even companies like Zapier and GitLab are still intentional about getting together quarterly or annually as an entire company. There's something that just cannot be replaced when you are together in person with a remote workforce. Consider this, proximity is a bit of an experience. Ignore the commute and the annoying coworkers. When you're with somebody, it's just a totally different vibe than when you're calling in or chatting or doing something from your home. In Goodwill Hunting, Robin Williams talks to Matt Damon's character about an experience. He says, you may be well studied and you may know the theory, but you can't tell me what it smells like in the Sistine Chapel. Now, do you want to smell your teammates? Probably not, but you can't replicate the experience of being together in a distributed workforce. Physical proximity is also a huge catalyst for communication. Consider how much body language goes into what we're talking about. Like me, they tell me all the time that I, I move my hands way too much in these videos, but like that body language conveys a level of excitement and, and genuine interest in whatever the topic is that I'm talking about. And I'm super aware of what I'm doing with my hands, but that 70% of what we say is communicated through body language. Proximity also lets you interrupt each other. Interrupting is actually a pretty natural part of a healthy dialogue and conversation. When you're on Zoom and you have that delay, it's always, oh, it, uh, ah, no, you go, no, I go, okay. You both wait and then you both talk at the same time. It happens all the time. I'm over it, okay? Proximity also lets you play with toys. I'm, I'm a huge whiteboard guy. I love drawing on the whiteboard and seeing what everybody's face is doing. I love handing things out and reviewing prints together. And you know, I'm a big fan of presenting in person as well because that, that's the whole skill that you have besides just having your face on a screen. Another big boon of proximity is the professional development. Apparently there's this huge endemic with mentorship and leadership development. According to WFH research, we have about a 30 to 40% dip in the amount of time spent with mentorship and leadership development training activities. 
This is an extremely big problem when you think about onboarding somebody who's never done it before or someone who's new to a career or you're switching roles into something else and you don't have that, that kind of community around you to help lift and support you. You can't ask random questions to people who are just over the wall of the cubicle. It has to be a lot more intentional. A 30 to 40% dip in that time may have impacts that we don't realize. And when you're talking about building up a culture and to be more productive overall, that, that's a really big gap to overcome in other ways. It has to be addressed very intentionally. And finally, and it probably goes without saying, the proximity helps overcome the isolation endemic that's kind of quietly happening in a lot of places. Being remote or being hybrid is hard to build a community. You feel lonely. And a lot of people have talked about their struggles with mental health due to being away from all the people that they are supposed to spend time with every day. We're, we're social creatures. We're meant to be with other people doing other things. And when you make that harder to do by being very remote or being very hybrid, there's a much higher need for supplementing that in some form. It's possible that the pandemic and the Generation Z, Zoom generation learning on school has actually impacted our professional standards in a lot of ways because when you've been remote so long, then when you get together in person again, you're not as like qualified on eye contact, you're not as good at your dress code, you don't really know how to behave as well. It even happened to me when we had to stay at home for a couple of years and we didn't go out that often. Like I had to have to remember the etiquette. Like how do I actually act around people? How do I dress myself in not sweatpants to be part of this community again? Learning to be in groups is a critical skill, not just for work, but just being part of your local community. Ultimately, the truth about remote work is it has to be right for you. The way that you structure that depends on the culture of your team, about the personalities that are at play, about the leadership, about the values and the principles that you hold. How much or how little depends on what you want to do. You can look at the global trends, but those are kind of distracting because that's just a big aggregate. It's a hard to define number. Are people more productive? I'm not sure. Are teams more suited for getting things done globally? Probably. Ultimately, it depends on the wiring of your team. Most importantly, I think there's more shenanigans and camaraderie when you're together. And I believe goofing off will play a very important role in taking over the world. That's all I have for you. I hope some of this was helpful, useful, insightful. If you found any of it good, click that like button, subscribe if you want. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next video. Thanks.